Christian church here, it kind of has two halves. The first half starts with the season of Advent and then, and then Christmas early on. And it goes through Easter and then 50 days after that, you've got the day of Pentecost and then it's done. It's the first half of the church here. And the rest of the half of the church here is the half we're in now. And it lasts through Thanksgiving, although Thanksgiving is not part of the church here, it's just an American holiday. Uh, but that's how far it goes. Uh, so it goes through the fall. And the first half of the church here is known as the festival half. So we're in the non-festival half. The festival half is called the festival half because it has Christmas and Easter and Epiphany and, and, and Good Friday and Pentecost and, and all of the festivals. Uh, the rest of it doesn't have a whole lot of attention getting stuff. That's why we do some sermon series, just kind of break it up and, and draw our attention to something new again. Uh, but the first half, the festival half, is about what God has done. The second half of the church here is about what God teaches. Just a way of making sure that we cover it all every year. So some of these sermon series that we have in the summer, they are intended to talk about what God teaches, not so much about what God has done. So that's what we have today with this new sermon series on common Christian misconceptions. Dear friends in Christ, start children off in the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. I think many of us are familiar with that passage, one of the more familiar passages in the Bible, not one of the most familiar, but one of the more familiar. I think probably, probably everyone has heard it, maybe not quite everyone, but uh, some of you probably could recite it back from memory, but not only is it one of the more well-known passages in the Bible, I think it's also one of the more often misunderstood passages of the Bible. And that's the kind of thing we'll talk about throughout this new series. Talking about some common Christian misconceptions. There are, there are many people who I think will look at this verse and come to the conclusion that it's a guarantee. A guarantee from God that a godly home guarantees godly children. So people can think, can be led to think that if I just do that, if I just, if they just raise their children in the right way in a godly home, and they're guaranteed that they will not stray from the faith or that even if they do, that eventually they're going to come back at some point. And that's a false idea. The false idea that can lead to hurt for parents. This false idea leads Christian parents to have unwarranted guilt because they assume that if their child drifts away, that must mean that their home was not godly enough. That they failed in some way. That it must be their fault. Or this false idea also, this, this misconception of this passage can lead Christian parents to have false and unsupported sense of security. And thinking that even if their child is wayward and living in rejection of Jesus, they can think that because of the way they were raised, that, that they're still safe. Even though I think we all know baptized unbelief. This morning we're going to address and, and, and debunk this idea, this myth, that godly homes guarantee godly children. We're going to replace it with instead strong encouragement from God simply to train your child in the way they should go. That's it. That's what's in your picture. The first thing to understand about this passage, and probably the main thing you need to understand about this passage, is that it's from the Bible, but it's not a promise. It's a proverb. Right? There's a difference. A promise is something that is, is a sure thing, especially God's promises. God always keeps his promises. God's promises are always fulfilled. But a proverb is different. A proverb is simply an observational statement about a general truth of life, right? how, how life generally works. The book of Proverbs in the Bible is full of these general observations from God. God breathed observations. But realize that if this was a promise, it would depend on you. Right? It would be a promise that depends <coughs> on the parent. And God doesn't make those kinds of promises. God doesn't make promises that depend on you. This is not a promise. 
It's an observation not of what always happens, but of what usually happens. Some other examples from the, from the from biblical Proverbs. Lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. That's generally true. But sometimes a lazy guy strikes it rich and, and a diligent man will lose it all. The proverb is an observation, not a guarantee. Another one, the fear of the Lord adds length to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. So if you engage in an inappropriate, violent, irresponsible lifestyle that is contrary to God's law, then you're more likely to end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. But it's not a promise. Tragedy will continue to strike children, and prisons will continue to have convicts that live into their 90s. The proverb presents good advice from God, but not a promise from God. Proverbs just point out the way things typically work in life. And the same is true of the problem that we're looking at today. Proverbs 22, 6. Train a child in the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. What that's saying is that the children who are brought up in God's Word are more likely to be and to stay in God's Word and to remain faithful throughout their life. It's not a promise. But it does seem to be the way that things generally work. Children tend to, to, to live out what they were raised to recognize as important. And it typically also works the other way around. And there's a proverb for that. A reprimand imparts wisdom, but a child left undisciplined disgraces its mother. A child who does not receive godly love and discipline in the home is more likely to stray to the shame and embarrassment of their parents. Sometimes you'll have exceptions. But usually, that's what we'll see. Now, if you're a gardener and you, you plant some seeds, you treat all those seeds the same way. And if you're good at gardening, most of those seeds are going to sprout, right? Come up and grow and do well, but not all of them. Why? You don't know. And there's probably no way for you to know. Now, you can, you can state some general truths about the majority and how to take care of that kind of seed. And that, that kind of thing can be helpful to, to others who will do the same thing that you're trying to do. But it's not a guaranteed absolute truth for every single one. You can't make the seed grow. You can't force it. All you can do is provide for the seed, enable its growth, take care of it, make sure that it has everything that it needs, try to remove anything that could harm it. On the other hand, you, you can hinder the seed. You can, you can leave it without enough water. You can give it too much water. And sometimes it's not that easy to tell which is which. Sometimes, when even, even though you know that you've done something wrong, the seed will still sprout. And sometimes, even when you try and you think that you've done everything right, it's still good. Remember that there's, there's always a whole lot of variables that will just be out of your control. There are going to be times, there are going to be years when it's just dry. When you can't do what you want to do. When you can't do what you know that you are supposed to do. So you put your best effort forward, and yet there are still things that will affect your seed that are just out of your hand. You do what you can. Sometimes you recognize your, your fault. Sometimes you're just baffled. But always, you eventually just get to the point where you have to leave it up to God. And the same is true of raising children and parenting. This passage encourages us to recognize that if we surround our children with God's Word, and if we set the example for them of God's Word, then they are more likely to continue even when they are old. There are going to be unexpected experiences that happen to them that are out of your control, so you do everything that you possibly can with the things that are in your control. To surround them with God's Word, to set the example for them of God's Word, so they can have a chance of believing it, of following it, and teaching it to their children. And give your children the goal of knowing God's word better than you do. If it's important, if that kind of thing is important, then treat it like it's important. 
not something that gets pushed to the side. Encourage them to grow, to continue to grow in, in, throughout their lives in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you're content to have your children know almost as much as you do, to feel like they're almost as close to Christ as you are, well then that's what they'll be comfortable with for their children too. And how many generations does it take before that comfort level is something that's not existing? Set a goal for your children to be a better Christian than you are. How do we do that? It can start with something like recognizing that, that, that Christmas and Easter are big deals and that they're all about Jesus. And, and a lot of parents like to play games with their children at Christmas and Easter. And if it's you, that you recognize that if, at, at Easter time, Christmas time, especially Easter is a big deal. If you find yourself saying, believe this, this is real, trust me, but what you're talking about is not Jesus instead it's the North Pole or a bunny, then re don't be surprised when your children end up questioning everything you've ever told them about Christmas and Easter. Because you've just thrown your credibility out the window. If you want to play the game, I'm not going to say that it's wrong. It is just a game. But be able to treat it like just a game. Also recognize that you may well be setting up a very added challenge for yourself as you, as you try to lead your children and to recognize and to impart for them what truly is most important. Now, with discipline, let's say, yeah. Let Jesus be a part of the discipline in the home. Uh, look for teachable moments when your children are arguing with each other or with a friend. To tell them about their Savior. When they're upset about something meaningless. Tell them why it's meaningless. And don't just say you're grounded. Also say you're forgiven. If you want your children to not make the same mistakes that you did, then be open with them. Do not treat the sins of your youth as if they are the sins that your youths now get to commit, as if somehow you've opened that door for them. <laughs> Confess your mistakes to them so that they can learn from them and so also so that then they can appreciate their Savior as they see you appreciate yours. Teach your children that you love them. And teach them that Jesus loves them more. Don't set any expectations for them that you don't set for yourself. If you want your children to use manners and not profanity, if you want your children to study God's word, uh, to sit, have bedtime prayers, to be in church or Sunday school, then you too. I think dropping a child off for Sunday school is more harmful than not having them there. Because, yeah, while they get to hear about Jesus, they also have this example set of Jesus doesn't matter when you get older. I think it would be more, more beneficial for that child if that parent that morning, whatever that parent has to do instead of being in church and Bible class, for that parent to talk to the child about Jesus, to share a Bible story without setting a hypocritical double standard. And when it comes to sports, just make sure that you have more conversations with your child about sin and grace than you do about offense and defense. Now, if you have a child who has grown up on their own, and they're going to church and, and trusting in Jesus as their Savior, living out their faith, and, and trying to live out God's will in their life, then praise and thank God. Give, give the credit and glory to God. You planted the seed, but God made it grow. Also, your responsibilities haven't ended. You still have opportunities to encourage your children in their faith and to model Christian faith for them. And pray for them. That they remain faithful children of God. If you have children who are grown on their own and have prayed for their faith, no longer confessing Jesus as Savior or, or just, just not living their faith, don't sugarcoat it. I know it's a burden. 
an unwanted burden for a parent, but don't placate it. Don't appease it and try to lie to yourself just to try to make it feel better. It always love them. Unconditionally and undeservingly. And try to be sure that part of your burden is not unwarranted guilt. Sure, maybe there are things that you, you, you see you could have done differently. We all can. But that doesn't, that doesn't make it your fault. Continue to share your faith. To model Christ for them. And I pray for you. If you have children who are still home, you are fully in the process of, of raising them. My encouragement for you is no surprise today. Train your child in the way they should go. Surround your child with God's word, the truth, the direction, the promises of the one who loves them most. If you want them to put Jesus first in their lives, then put Jesus first in yours. You influence them in everything that you say and do. And if you want them to believe that Jesus is important, then you need to show it. Not just for an hour of week that doesn't necessarily make sense because it's so contradicted by so much else going on in life. But communicate it in a way that they can understand. Show it. Have family devotions with them. Pray with your children. Teach them what you know about God. Not just what you think, not just what you opine, but what you know. Let God's word be at the heart of your life and at the center of all that you do. And you can, you can take advantage of some of the resources that our congregation offers. Cradle Roll, Sunday School, Teen Group Bible Study, Weekly Emails, Teens Devotions, Youth Group, Teen Group. I think that five years ago, there probably would have been several families who would have said that they, they would like to see the church offer more opportunities for teens and youth. And the opportunities are, are here now. And it's time to take advantage of them and to make them a priority. Let's talk about the one who made you a priority. The one who did not stray and who did not turn from the way that he should go. And we'll talk about him as a promise, not as a problem. You realize that God the Father has experienced both ends of the spectrum when it comes to, to raising children in the way that they should go. The first children of God the perfect Father rebelled against Him. They turned. So if you're a parent whose child has strayed, God knows your heartache. God also knows the joy of having a child who turned out exactly as he hoped. Jesus the divine, God the Son, came into the world 2,000 years ago as a human son of God. He was perfectly obedient, perfectly following the way he should go in every aspect of his life. But that perfect, holy, obedient child was sacrificed in place of you. And he took your sins. All your, your, your imperfect parenting and all your immature rebellion. He took it to the cross. And he gave you his perfection. And now, because of that, because of the perfect son, God the Father looks at you. And with joy, says, this is my child, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. It's not a problem. That's a promise. God grant you. Amen. And may the love of God, which surpasses even our own for our children and our understanding, continue to guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus until life everlasting.